Hey, welcome to another episode of Making Pittsburgh Healthy. You are in for some fun today. There's 83 years of wisdom on the other line today. We have Dr. William Walsh, medical doctor, graduated school in 1970. So a lot of information, a lot of wisdom, a lot of learning that he's going to be sharing with you. You've got to listen to every minute of this. When he was in the Air Force for two years, he discovered the fascination with treating diseases with the environment and the diet. All new at this time, and it was quite a discovery for him as well. After four years of allergy fellowship at the Mayo Clinic, he was now certified as an allergy specialist, which led him to a startling conclusion that diet causes dementias. And you're going to hear his personal story with dementia and his discovery with diet, his medical research, and how the environment and diet play a direct role. And I'm really excited because I had allergies as a kid, and my diet, my lifestyle were off. I'm going to share my story as well. But Dr. Walsh, thank you for joining us today. We're excited to have you. Tell us a little bit about yourself, what you like to do for fun, and what gets you up in the morning. Oh, okay. <laughs> Actually, I get up in the morning at uh, four o'clock in the morning, and wow. and and um, I go to bed at eight o'clock at night. Though, but uh, what really turns me on, I, I love to uh, to write, uh, and I spend a good part of the day writing, and it's just fun for me to sit down and write things. And I, I, you mentioned already that I'm eighty three years old. And uh, as I write, I have a feeling that uh, maybe I'll leave something of value behind. I certainly do want to. And one of the things that leave behind of value is the fact that I have dementia. I found my way to get out of it, and I did get out of it. And I'd like to, to uh, have people, I'd like to teach people how to do that. Um, so uh, that's one of the reasons for being here. Uh, do you have a question? Yeah, I was going to say, you, you've written countless books, and I've, I've watched uh, some of your interviews where every time you wrote a book, you realized you didn't know that much, you wrote another one. You didn't know as much as you need to, you wrote another one, which that's the, that's the discovery of staying in the game. A lot of people tap out. And just, you know, they put in their time and they tap out. So I love your energy at 83 years old, your excitement. You're still going strong. But let me ask you this. So we go back to, you're in the Air Force. You graduated 1970. Is Was medicine looking at diet and environment for sickness, disease, allergies at that time? Or is this something new that you discovered? Uh, it really wasn't looking at it at all. In fact, the... the Medicine has not looked at the diet seriously until it started to look at um, obesity and trying to control that. And for many years, uh, certainly during most of the years that I was in practice, we all we thought that, well, you get fat, and so that's obesity, so it must be the fat in the diet that's causing the obesity. Well, what we found out later is um, that, no, it's not the fat in the diet, it's the sugar in the diet that's causing it, which is a complete surprise because if you're fat, there should be the fat in the diet that's causing it, mm -hmm. but no, it's not. And the reason being that sugar is giving is the trouble is that sugar in certain, in excess uh, is poisonous and poisons some of the systems of the body that uh, keeps you alert and, and, and active and fat and not fat. Um, I, and that was a big, well, two things really set me on the path of sugar and other, uh, other uh, parts of the diet uh, that, that can cause illness. Um, one is the tremendous work done by Dr. Robert Lessig um, uh, of um, the University of California at San Diego. He's an endocrinologist and a pediatrician, and he wrote about sugar and calls it a poison. And that really started me on my working uh, of, of looking at sugar and looking at the diet in a different way than looking at fat, which was, as I said, what was uh, the thought before. Um, 
and um, I, back in, oh, when I was about 40, 50, and at that time, I was really kind of fat myself. In fact, I have two brothers who are overweight, and I, and, um, I have also two other brothers, but the two overweight brothers both died, uh, a sudden death, cardiac death. Uh, one at 50 and one at 59. And so I thought to myself, well, I've got to change this. I've got to, I've got to lose weight. Um, and so I said to myself, uh, knowing myself, I am, uh, I have the uh, willpower of a gnat. <laughs> not, not very much at all. And so I said, I, I can't really follow an organized diet because I never will do it. But I'll take one thing out of my diet. I'll take the sugar out of my diet. Mm. And so I did. And I in no way cut back on my food. But um, as time went on, over a long period of time, I lost weight. In fact, I'm continuing to lose weight because I continue to have sugar out of my diet. And I started out from 100 or 248 pounds. Mm -hmm. And now I am, and I, first of all, my first drop down through using the sugar itself, um, when uh, I went from 248 to uh, 200 pounds. And then at that time, I started to get symptoms that were coming that I thought I'd better worry about as far as a little bit of dementia, a little losing of memory and stuff like that. And so I extended the foods that I'm avoiding and I kept dropping down until I hit 150. And then when I hit 150 pounds, um, I uh, was reading someplace that uh, the, uh, that in some of the special diets they have that are known to be healthy diet, they eliminate uh, things like uh, lipids, like uh, oils, uh, mm -hmm. olive oil, for instance, the one. And I use olive oil a lot. And I thought, well, that's kind of interesting. I wonder if olive oil might have something in it that is is a cause of my dementia and also uh, my um, obesity. And so I took olive oil out of my diet and I dropped down to 145 pounds. Just dropped five within. It takes time. It takes a good week or two before something like that works. And now there's still something in my diet because I'm going down from 145 to 143 and a half. Um, that is a long explanation, but in, in order to understand really what's happening and why people are having um, uh, obesity and how you reverse the obesity is to take certain things out of the diet that are really causing you to have, to poison you, mm -hmm. unfortunately. And the things that I have, my, my book tells you all about this in more detail. Uh, the uh, things I am avoiding that have both cut down my weight and also have returned my thinking and so forth back. In fact, my memory is better than it was when I went to medical school. Mm -hmm. In medical wow. school, I had a poor memory. I know it was affecting me back at that time. And I was studied for big tests the day before because I knew I couldn't retain it all. Uh, if for you know the weeks beforehand, uh, but now things are coming easier for me every day, every week. It seems my memory is coming back, and that's from avoiding sugar plus the other things that are really poisonous for us in, in the diet. And I think it's your turn to ask a question. Yeah, and I was going to say, even before we jump into all that. Um, you know, when you said sugar is a poison, I'll say that to my patients and I'll, I just tell the kids that, you know, it's like they say, what about smoking? I'm, I just say, well, smoking will cause cancer. I don't explain the, all the details behind it. And I think people are probably quite surprised hearing this from a medical doctor too, sugar is poison. But what's interesting, and this is what I think intrigued me when I was young, I had, I had allergies and I was always sick. My digest, the digestion GI system was always sick growing up. 
And then I had allergies in, in junior and high school. IBS, which back then was, just, was chronic diarrhea. And then I had sinus issues. So I was always spraying stuff up my nose for my sinuses, taking over the counter meds. And I, we went to see the allergist in town. And I didn't understand, we didn't go to many doctors ever in my life, but we went to this allergist doc and he, he was probably a hundred and some pounds overweight. Uh, he smoked, I could smell the smoke on him. He looked incredibly unhealthy. And my mom was taking me there to get healthy. And I, I got the shot and I left, but I, I, le I was left with, why does he look so bad? Because I was an athlete in high school. So I was trying to get healthy. I was trying to understand health. And back then, you had to read books uh, or you know, talk to somebody. You, you didn't have all the research we have today so accessible. And I, I never forgot that first meeting. And we went back many times and I never thought, why did, why was he look so unhealthy? But he's trying to help me with health. So once I, I discovered uh, later on, I, I just ended up stopping all my drugs and shots and I ended up getting a little bit better. Uh, but it wasn't, I discovered chiropractic lifestyle eating kind of as all in one and then it transformed my life. When you talk about the sugar. I, I think a lot of people can relate. Sugar's bad. Everyone will say that. Oh, sugar's bad. How you did it, they're probably going, how did he get sugar out of his diet? But you also mentioned olive oil. Now, olive oil in the Mediterranean diet, and olive oil with healthy fats. Why did you take that out? Because that's probably shocking to people. And I'm curious myself, that's a, that's a healthy fat. Why did you take that out? Was that a risk of dementia? Is that something that was adding to it? Or was that just for weight itself because of the fat content? Let me see if I can explain this. I think it's a, maybe it's a little bit difficult, but um, when, when the, the foods that cause you to have dementia have many, many effects, as, as you're aware. You, I know that you're aware of diet, and, and I, I know that some of what we're talking about, I'm talking about, you're very well aware of. Um, the 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 effect of foods on the brain in in causing dementia is to kill the nerve cells in the brain, and so the brain shrinks with time. Um, and the nerves, of course, as you know, uh, innervate every part of the body. In fact, there are three separate nervous systems in the human body. Uh, one is the central nervous system, and that's where you do things that you, um, it, where, where you think about something and you do it. You grab a, uh, a glass and you take a swallow of, of uh, water. There's the autonomic nervous system. That's all the various functions like uh, breathing and heart rate and so forth, all the things that go on without you doing anything about it. And then there's a third, and that's the intestinal uh, nervous system. Uh, and that has an effect, uh, particularly if the other two nervous systems no longer function, the, the, at least the, the, the intestinal nervous systems keep functioning. Well, one of the things that the intestinal nervous system and the autonomic nervous system is regulate the body uh, I mean, the, the intestine so that it pushes food through and finally pushes it out and, and, uh, and assists in, di in um, uh, metabolize, in, in absorbing food into the body. And if it's, in other words, when we have something that causes dementia, it's a whole body poison. And sometimes, the easiest way to check to see whether your diet is pretty free of that so that your brain can recover is to watch other symptoms. And one of the symptoms that I watch, I'm very susceptible to, is um, constipation. Um, if, I, uh, if, if I am eating wrong, um, my bowel slows down, just stops, boom, stop. It's the same thing. It's what happens in my brain. It happens in the nerves down in my intestine. Um, and so I was having trouble with that. And I also, you know, thought, gee, you know, I've investigated other types of other poisons in the diet um, that are bothersome for us. I said, I've never taken 
uh, olive oil out of the diet because I've used a lot of it and I considered it totally safe. And so mm -hmm. I took it out in order to see if I lost weight, then it had to be affecting my brain too. Did I, did I explain that? I hope. So yeah, you, it, it, it's one of those, it's one of those foods that we're told and I've always learned that, you know, we need healthy fats for our brain. Mm -hmm. Um, and olive oil is a healthy fat. Did you substitute that with a different type of fat? Oh, yes, absolutely. In fact, <clears throat> I'm, you slowly progress into dementia. You don't all of a sudden, as I say, a child have right. a, a dementia like a, a 60-year-old, say, or a 70-year-old. Um, and during the time that you grow up, it's really wise for you to know what things cause severe dementia because you can cut down then mm -hmm. on some of the things that you're eating that you don't really care about. And that does slow down the onset of dementia. So instead of getting dementia at 50, you get it at 70. Right. Um, um, and uh, boy, I lost my train of thought. This is one thing that I run into <laughs> with this is that I can keep going if, if, if well, it's well, let me ask, long let, enough, I'll lose it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I do the same thing. Let me ask you this. What foods, you know, we're, we're talking dementia is affecting us earlier and earlier. And I do, a, I do a, a workshop in high schools and junior highs on digital dementia. They are showing a rise of 15% increase in early onset dementia because of computers and screen time. Screen time sitting at, a, at all on your phone or computer for, for kids under eight, 18 is seven and a half hours a day. That blows my mind. How do they do it? That's really? good gosh. And with adults, it's over 10 hours. It's up to about 10 hours and 45 minutes, which again, astronomical. So wow. it's way beyond what I would suspect. Same here. And, and I, it's only getting worse because we carry our phones around with us everywhere. And we, not only do we stare at them, but we're staring at them with horrendous posture with our neck, looking down at this screen all day. But let's go back to the foods, you know, early onset of dementia, People listening, you, you have to realize, don't wait for the symptoms of dementia or your spouse or family member to say, honey, I think you're losing your memory. We need to start changing your foods. You've been poisoning yourself for 50 years. Now it's high time to change. This is insane, but this is what we're doing, doc. Let me ask you this. What foods should the listener start to, to, to look at and avoid? Because if they're poisonous, we may not be able to avoid everything. We realize that. Like sugar, it's hard to say you eliminate it completely, but we have to dramatically reduce it. And as an overall, when we look at foods, I teach my kids, I have five kids, and I teach my kids, you got to read the labels. And when if they bring a food into the house with aspartame or MSG, I get mad. <laughs> Are you kidding me? You're putting poison into your body. You're destroying your brain. What foods should we be looking at? What chemicals are the, the top ones that people need to start avoiding now? Okay. Um, there are about, it's, I, I, I was, I lost on the explanation and I lost it. Let me go back to it a little bit. Um, when we say you have to avoid, as a child or as a growing adult, you don't have to avoid as much as I have to avoid it because I've got dementia so bad that if five years ago, I couldn't talk in a long sentence because when I started to talk a sentence, when I got to the middle of the sentence, I forgot with how I started it. Mm. And so for me, I'm at the very end stage of dementia where if I let go, I get in trouble. So when we're talking to children and, and young adults and so forth, um, with the value for them of knowing what I have to avoid is not that they should do it now, but it keeps them in mind of the things that they should go light on now. And if they go light on now, they might never reach the stage that I'm in. Uh, so when you talk about, to, to, to sum up what you have to avoid, is that you have to eat only natural foods. And when I say natural, uh, I mean natural. Uh, we're down to uh, 
my wife and I are down to just a few vegetables that we can eat. And then we have to, I have to treat them in a special way in order to try to get out what farmers have put into the vegetable to make it pleasant tasting and saleable. That's what's causing the dementia. And why is it causing dementia? Because these are very strong nerve stimulants. And all through your life, through three meals a day, you are eating things that stimulate your, your taste buds and gives you this wonderful feeling. It tastes good. It, it's, it's wonderful. Like we talked about citrus already. Citrus is a wonderful tasting thing. It's just great. But it is a poison. Um, so if when you ask what do you have to give up, you have to give up uh, or try to take out of the foods what, what farmers have put in the foods to make them more delicious. And um, for instance, I went through a whole line of vegetables to find one that didn't stop my, you know, didn't put me into constipation. Using constipation as again, as a measure of the, um, of my, uh, a tendency toward dementia and, uh, and harm to my brain. I went through lettuce and I went through spinach and I went through peas and I went through other things too, with various with potatoes. And every single one of them stopped me up. And which means for me, I can't take them because I'm. I'm that far away from sliding back into it. And as long as I don't eat these foods. So when you say, what do you give up? It's easy to say what, better to say what you, what we, we primarily have an animal diet. Mm -hmm. Fruit, I mean, not fruit. Fruit's got citrus in it, uh, most fruit. Um, and also it, uh, the sugar part of the, the bad part of the sugar is also in fruit. Um, but um, we eat uh, uh, things like beef and pork and turkey and and chicken um, and not only that that's our prime and, and various types of fish. Like for lunchtime, we'll often have uh, a, a leftover meat from what we had the night before, and um, uh, also mixed in with. Uh, um, salmon from a can and, and put that together sometimes with, uh, um, um, uh, with uh, oysters uh, to give it some extra flavor. Um, but to, for us who have to be so strict, it's a diet of very few things. It's a little bit um, un- uh, a little bit uh, boring, frankly, but it maintains its ability. I, I still maintain the ability to write, to talk, you know, to 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 remember what somebody's name. I live in a in a senior home with 150 people. I can remember most of the names now of the people. I'm not to where I look at somebody and say, I know you, you live right next door and I can't remember who you are. I don't want to go back to that again. But in order to do that, I have to do, I have to be very careful uh, that I eat only what has not been improved in farming. Um, and even with that, we have to be careful because the, the drippings from the fruit, uh, from the, the meat and from the fish and so forth, we have to just throw that away. Although you can't make uh, you can't make um, uh, 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 oh flour in that and drippings is I forget the name for that. It's sorry. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, well, so it's it's but if you listen to it, it's too tough to do. And you don't have to do it if you're younger. You just know that there's problems in those foods and just cut down on your intake of them. You can have a normal diet, but just a normal diet without, with, with 
decreasing the amount of things that are really bad. And, and that's why sugar comes in because sugar is a really bad thing. And what it does, it, it'll poison one of the, I can, I will continue to lose weight. I've lost over a hundred pounds. And the only thing I've done is take sugar on my diet. I eat just a lot. Um, what, if, what happens though, if you, if you don't eat sugar, then your body will regulate its own fat. And if I overeat, like at a dinner table, um, and then when I later on, I will become very warm. I'll start perspiring with, right, if I'm in a warm room. And what's happening is that my BM, my basal metabolic rate has kicked up until it gets back. I probably have put on a pound, but until it gets back, to that 150 or now 145 and then 143 and a half. Uh, it always comes back to that if you don't poison it with the sugar. So it's not the, it's not the calories of the sugar that really gets you. It's its ability to, to poison certain body symptoms that are valuable for you. The, and, if you have if you have obesity, you're you're setting yourself up for, as my brothers passed away from from for cardiac attacks, um, for uh, um, uh, for uh, um, for diabetes, all the other illnesses that uh, come from uh, obesity. And I, I read a, a statistic recently that 40% of all related cancers are related back to obesity, 40%. So, and when you look at obesity, what you just said there, the sugar is the main thing. I mean, that's, we used to think that the fats back probably in the, the 70s and 80s, and that's, that all changed. And the sugar causes inflammation and the inflammation starts plaquing and causing all kinds of havoc in the body. Let me ask you this, with how the brain I functions. I agree very much with what you said. And, it's, it's, and when you said, it was funny, you said, you go light on it now. I would say like, no, we need to stop this. So you're, you're a little bit, you're, be, you're more, um, I guess, you're, that's a better way to approach it. I get a little radical at times. I'm like, stop it, even though it's very hard for me to just uh, you know, completely stop things. We need, to, we need to go light on things. I think those are good words of wisdom. Well, let me ask you this with to carry that just a little bit further too. The people who are following this diet, particularly the people who already have dementia, need help, and mm -hmm. they don't need just a, a visit, one visit. It's a continual visit as you help them and get used to this diet and, and encourage them and weigh them and so forth. Because I I did it by myself, but I did it because I got two brothers who died and I was scared stiff. And plus, I didn't want to lose what's happening up there. Um, but when you see people who have these problems, you as you know, you've got to have them back. You've got to give them uh, advice and encouragement and because following this diet is not easy and particularly as it gets harder and harder as you get older and older and I find too that when I when I'm talking with my patients I'm always trying to encourage and like keep away from the naysayers because a lot of people want to bring you down they're obese they're overweight they like their their horrible foods they want to stay there so as we start to change things we've got we've got to have support we've got to have support around us if not we'll be pulled right back into it. Why? Because it's all around us. Every place you go from church events to, to parties, to birthday parties, it's sugar. It's you want a pop, you want a beer, you want a glass of wine, you want an ice cream cake. You want, it's like, oh my gosh, it's everywhere. So it is a challenge. It's not going to be easy. And unfortunately, when in your situation, you lose two brothers, in my situation, when, I, when my dad died at 50, I drew a line in the sand and I said, that's not going to be me. I didn't know what that meant, but I knew I'm going to find out. And in your situation, you, you discovered you had dementia later on in life. Is there, is there a chance when the, when the brain gets damaged, the nerves in the brain get damaged, 
is there a chance that you can reverse some of this? And Absolutely. how much how much of it can be reversed? Because I'm sure a lot of people are out there saying, well, my parents have it, or my husband or wife is starting to have it. Is there hope? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. It used to be thought that the brain was a solid, you know, an organism that never healed itself. But the brain can heal itself, except if you're poisoning the, the cells, the little nerve cells that are continually being produced and added to the brain. If you poison them, like with sugar and with citrus and with the other things that uh, we are talking about, um, it, it won't happen. And there's normal wear and tear in a brain, and it does get replaced with new nerve cells. But only if your diet is such that you're not killing those little nerve cells. When, to give you an illustration of how strong a, 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 um, the, the nerve stimulation is, from the foods that taste good. Just think of when you eat something like an ice cream cone or you have a bite of, of um, cherry pie, how long does it take you to taste that? It, you comp down on it and you taste it right away. That is strong. It's a very strong neurostimulant. And it's, it's a neurotoxin actually is so strong. Because once you swallow it, um, it goes through the body. It doesn't just go out. It goes through the body for three days. It's in the body uh, and it's continually overstimulating these nerves until the point that over 20, 30, 40, 50 years, um, you, they eventually get out. They eventually die. And you, you, your brain is not supplied with new, fresh brain cells as you grow. And as you low edge, as you live into your older age, unless you stop poisoning the little nerve cells that are trying to make it from where they're being born in the body to the brain. So the brain is perfectly able to come back and, and to be, and if you asked about how about somebody who is old. Um, I'll tell you a story if you have time. Yes. Uh, I was at a meeting uh, of people who have dementia or who care for people with dementia. And a, a person there, um, I don't want to identify this person anyway, said that her spouse had sunk so far that he was no longer able to feed himself. They were feeding him at the place where they were taking care of him. He was in a, a hospital setting. And they all got together and decided that it would be wise to let him go, that there's nothing in the future and, and just let him go. Uh, and they thought that was a human thing to do and a religious thing to do. I've talked to various uh, priests and ministers and they agree that it, with me that, that that's the right thing. So for a week, they gave him nothing but fluid. And at the end of the week, he sat up in bed and he smiled and he ate a big breakfast. Do you know why? It's because they stopped feeding him poison in his brain. And all of a sudden he's free of it. Well, he eventually died. The re I didn't say anything because it wasn't my role to say anything. I was simply an observer. I could have said, yes, he can recover but you have to follow this diet that you won't believe. It's the weirdest diet you've ever heard. And he will recover. The problem is it'll take him at least two to three or four years to recover because he's got to restock the brain with all those cells that he's been, that have been, he's been killing all along. And the fellow is already like 75, 80 years of age. In other words, you would be restoring somebody now during the time that you were restocking the brain, somebody would have to be taking care of him, cleaning him in the morning and, and feeding him. Uh, and he doesn't want that. I don't want it. I, my son has, is going to 
assume my care when things go bad. And I told them that I don't want to stay around. You know, if there's no hope for me, uh, or if it's if it's at an age that it's just not worthwhile to bring me back, let me go. I go find out what's going on on the other side of the of the I don't know of the universe. Uh, yeah, and you know, I, I remember well, you this. can come back, and, and <laughs> particularly if you only have mild symptoms of forgetfulness at 50 and so forth, come back. A couple of years of really following that diet, well, you'll start thinking again. And I'm sure it's, it's just amazing your journey that you saw this all starting to come back and actually recognized it that you know you're remembering things i remember reading you know years ago when they talked about the brain being a, a revitalizing organ not just you know if the brain's damaged it's damaged so new new research came out and said that it's called neuro neuroplasticity which i thought was just incredible because when when as a chiropractor when we're working with the spine one thing i i saw this was back in 1971 dr Speary, he was in brain research he found and he discovered that it was a Nobel Prize winner too, that 90% of the nourishment to the brain comes from the cerebral spinal fluid through movement. And I thought through movement. So as a chiropractor, if the spine or posture is locked up and it's not moving, we can't push the fluid into the brain for nourishment. And then we top it off with bad chemicals, poison, sugar, and then when we do get sick, what are we prescribed? More toxic chemicals, pharmaceuticals. So we have not only the pharmaceuticals, but the diet, no movement. And it's a, it's a dis destructive lifestyle, which we're seeing this all over. And I'm glad you said that because I, I believe that you're, you just gave a lot of people hope that there's no end. This is not over until it's over. And there are going to be limits, I'm sure, to healing depending on how long we've damaged ourselves. But knowing that at any age, if we begin to, to change, you're 83 and you've reversed a lot of that. Is it complete 100% reversal? Probably not, but is it life sustaining and functional? Absolutely. And I believe that that can carry on for the rest of your life, uh, but you have to be diligent. And uh, we should start taking that diligence now before we get to that stage it's it's crazy to think why why let disease enter our body why let obesity enter and and then have to fight back but let me ask you this with the citrus so i i looked at some of the that's, information that's fascinating <laughs> well you have me thrown off here i'm i'm looking at citrus and i looked into it and I, I read a little i understand a little bit about it but tell us why is citrus so somebody's grabbing an orange or a grapefruit and you're saying, don't do it. Why, why is citrus harmful? I got to tell you this. Okay. <laughs> I'm glad you asked. Um, I've known for a long time that there's a problem with citrus. And it comes up because, uh, and myself, um, I have, uh, I, every once in a while, I get cold sores. And they're little tiny cold sores that sit here or there mm -hmm. or something. And, and what the cold sore is, is that it's a, it's caused because there is a herpes virus infection of the nerve that supplies that area there and protects it. And um, if as long as you don't have citrus, it stays small and eventually goes away. <clears throat> if you have citrus, and this used to happen to me until I figured out this thing myself, uh, it would go from a small thing to a great big sore which indicates that I was really clobbering that nerve that already, you know, is already having trouble. It's already, it's already virus infected. So it isn't the virus infection alone that's causing that. It was the virus infection alone is causing the small sore, but the big sore is coming when you poison that nerve with citrus. Now carry this one step further. <clears throat> A huge proportion of us have um, a chronic indolent virus infection, herpes virus infection of the brain. And what do we do when we get a cold? 
we take citrus. Mm -hmm. Orange juice has got vitamin C. It's wonderful for colds and so forth. Well, of all the things that you don't need is to have a flush of acid and the citric acid going through and, and activating the virus, the indolent virus infection of your brain that you already got there. It may be that citrus is one of the primary causes of dementia, and I won't touch it. A second thing comes up is that in the dementias like uh, Parkinson's and Alzheimer's and, uh, and so forth, there are little bunches, little blobs of protein. They're all, all jumbled up together. And, that's a sign of the type of, uh, of uh, dementia that you have. What would cause them to um, clump up like that? And nobody really knows that, but here's a possibility. When you have a glass full of, of orange juice or other citrus containing food, doesn't that give you a whole body of flush of acid? And like a lot of the, a lot of the um, blood goes right from the intestine up through the brain and there drops off things like uh, really good things like glucose, so a good type of sugar. Well, can it also bring the acid there and cause the, that's one of the causes of a nerve becoming open and then closing and opening and closing and eventually opening and closing until it gets into a little mess. So isn't citrus one of the prime causes of what's called an inclusion body? So citrus is, is a dangerous thing. It, I know that it, it causes this to happen. And if it happens here, it must be happening up there too. That's, that's an interesting thing. I, I've never heard that. I remember in high school <clears throat> when I was getting my IBS, my allergies, my sinus, I started to get cold sores. I had chicken pox in, in eighth grade. And I thought, why is this coming out? But my cold sores were just what you said. It would turn into one and then it would spread throughout my entire lower lip. It would go inside my mouth. And I don't know if I was eating citrus at the time, but it if I knew that there was anything to help me, when I was in high school, I would have done anything because I looked horrendous. I felt bad. I felt like people were staring at me because I had these big cold sores on my mouth. I could hardly eat anything. Um, I tried everything. I tried alizine. I put ice on it. I tried, I did everything. Nothing ever worked. So interesting. And I, and I, I would think too, the sugars from the fruit, especially from a glass of orange juice, that's just all sugar. The sugar would actually accelerate that causing more inflammation and just make it twice as bad. I think so too. Absolutely. I, that was a very successful thing for me in my practice. I'd have people come in and they talk to me about these sores they get and I'd say, take the citrus out of your diet. And they'd say, what? <laughs> Why should I do that? It's good for you. And I said, no, it's not. <laughs> no, take it out. And then Woodbury always worked. When they came back to check up on it, the, 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 they had gone back to having just a small little cold sore, but instead not that big, splashy wash. Yeah. And the other thing is that I decided that... Um, in my hunt for foods I could eat, I decided I can get by with grapes. So for two weeks, I ate grapes. And all of a sudden, the whole roof of my mouth swelled up. Whole roof just swelled up. And you'd say, well, how'd that happen? Well, it's easy. It's the acid there got to the nerves that supply that. And I, so I stopped the, the grapes, the acid in the grapes, the tartaric acid, and also the citric acid. And, and it took about two weeks for that to finally settle back down again, but it did. And so dealing with that in my own personal life, not being a doctor, I know that that is poisonous. Uh, and from the number of patients I saw who had the same problems and that responded to stopping the citrus, I, that gives me further indications that there's problems there. And my worry that this indolent 
virus infection of the brain uh, will cause increase, uh, the citrus will cause that to be increasingly destructive. Uh, it convinces me we've got to keep the citrus away from our people. That's, that's interesting. Let me ask you this, with, with movement or exercise, uh, how important is that for brain function or flushing the system and, and revitalizing the nerve endings and healing the brain? Is, is movement and exercise as important as for dementia as sometimes we hear? I think it is, um, but I think that if you were to put down, if you have number one, two, three, as far as what factors cause dementia, the worst, the worst one is food. Food. Second is no lack of exercise, and third is all is lack of mental exercise. You know, not uh, using your brain enough. Yes, right. Uh, I, and the reason I don't specify that is that that's already been well covered. I don't need to specify this. What I have to specify is to tell people how to get out of it by changing their diet, and it's very possible. Yeah, and it's and. and even in my practice, you know, I, I can't cover everything I need to. I would have to spend hours with every patient every time they came in. That's why I do videos and I do workshops. And I write books and I, I refer them to people like yourself who've written the books that can specialize in that. And, and when you're listening to this, people, you, you, you want to continue to learn. Every guest I have on the show, and I always say this, go to the material, go to Dr. Walsh's books, get some of his books, start reading them and applying them. You may not apply everything, but you start to apply it. And this is like layers, just like when you were in medical school, when I was in chiropractic school, you learn a little bit, that becomes a base, then you learn a little bit more, and then you learn a little bit more. And that, that's what I think why you wrote so many books <laughs> is you kept learning and you had to go back and say, wait, I know more. I got to write some more things up. Um, I try to try to correct the mistakes I made in the earlier. <laughs> well, and and that's that's the journey we're on. Is you know we this is relationships we're in. We make mistakes all the time. I know I do. My kids and wife will testify to that. Um, but I do it. I just keep going. I try to keep learning. I try to keep studying, and I try to keep applying it. And when you learn these things, these are life changing. People, you start to limit your sugar. And you start to decrease sugar intake, not only for you, but for your kids. Don't let your kids build this up. You're changing their life. You're saving their life, saving a life of destruction, whether it's dementia or any kind of mental disease or illness or a physical one or dying early and leaving a family behind. When my dad died, it was unfortunate. My mom was left you know, single to take care of a house. I had a younger brother who was six years younger than me. She was raising him. I was off to college. It, no finances, no money. It was just such a such a heavy burden, which I look back and I think, man, if my dad knew what I knew and he applied it, and that's the thing, you, you, you can have knowledge, but if you don't apply it, just like yourself, you apply it every day uh, to, to make, your, make your life functional, that we could, we could avoid these things. So I, I, my prayer is, you know, people listening start to implement these strategies, go buy your book, start when you buy a book, here's, here's my advice. When you buy a book, this is what I do every time. Take a, and I have, it, so I have this right in front of me, a pen and a marker, a highlighter, and you mark the book, circle things, write it out, put notes in it. And then, because you, you want to take those nuggets and then apply it. And then it becomes habit. And then, then you build another habit. You'll learn these strategies from, from Dr. Walsh's books, from these podcasts. Don't just let them go one ear and out the other. Um, can, can I mention one thing? Uh, Absolutely. Yeah, um, I, I agree very much with what you're saying, but um, when I have put out <clears throat> all together out seven books, and they did well, and I'm very pleased with them. Only the last one should count because um, it's the one, I, I really take the same subject and keep redoing it and, and, and revising it and refreshing it. Um, so if you get an earlier book, you get, uh, it's not as good as the current book, which is, uh, I thought, which is titled How I Recovered from Dementia. Uh, 
the name is long, but I, I sat for a long time and said, what, what am I trying to say here? And uh, trying, uh, what I was trying to say is, hey, this is how I did it. Hey, if you can find some information in here that'll help you, for the sakes, I, I hope it does. But get the current book, the, not, not the old books, the, because they're, they're not as good as the current one. <laughs> I was going to say that, and I'm, I'm sure you were going to mention it anyhow, So, because that's how we always think. is like the old stuff, don't just get the new one, study it. Yeah. I remember hearing a, a chiropractor at an at a event where was at, I was at a workshop, and he was an incredible speaker, and his mind was just amazing. But he was, he was probably in his late 70s, 80s, and he said, look, what I've done is what I've done. He goes, you have to rise up to not just my level, but you have to continue and go way beyond. He goes, it doesn't just end here. And I looked at him and he was a mentor of mine. And I thought, wow, I could do more than him. And, and we, ha we have to at least strive for that. Just like your books, you, we can read them and we uh, apply them. But next year, there may be a new strategy that, that takes it and tweaks it a little bit, but it continues to improve upon it. It doesn't, this isn't, this isn't done. We never arrive. We never, we never figure it out. People say, when will I figure this out? I laugh. I say, you'll never figure it out. There is no figuring it out. All you're going to do is, as soon as you know some more, you know, you know that you don't know. So you have to keep, keep trying. So I love it. Um, as we kind of wrap this, this up and pull this together, because I, I think we could talk for quite a while. Um, oh, I've enjoyed it. I've enjoyed it. I, I have too. And I, I love your energy and your willingness to, as you are going through um, this journey of yours and you've recovered from dementia, to just keep going. Many people could just say, you know what, I've put in my time, let the, let the younger people do it. I've said, and I have, a lot, I have pastors as patients, I said to a pastor once, I said, um, there's, retirement isn't in the Bible, is it? He laughed. He goes, Yes, it is. I said, it is not. He said, it, it, and he gave me a verse. He said, Moses died. And I said, okay, that's when I retire. I don't ever plan to retire. I, I may make some shifts in my career like you have, but I'm proud of you. And I'm glad that you continue to educate the community and continue to write books because this is, this is greatly affecting uh, everyone. And I look at it and think, my kids... And my grandkids, I have three grandkids now, and then my great-grandkids, where will they be when they're growing up? Are they going to have this information? Are we going to make changes now so their life is better? Or are we just going to put this aside and, and let them live a destructive life? Well, I want to make a difference. I don't want my, I told my kids, you can be healthier than, than I ever imagined I could be. And your kids could even be healthier because you're, cl you're cleansing and purifying everything from mental physical spiritual and if you keep if you keep doing it then you can get even better um how would you like to to kind of wrap this up what are what are things that you haven't said that you would like the listeners to know? Uh, very much i am so pleased that you that we talked i i have the feeling that you very much understand what we we're talking about I hope that you have a hundred people with advanced dementia come into your office and I would hope that you will say, come on in, I know what to do. And that's the reason that I'm here. If I can spread that information around, particularly to treatment, treating people like you, you know, doctors who treat patients, um, then I've done something that will last long after I'm gone. And I'm very, very pleased with that. Yeah, and I'll tell you, that's the heart of a servant and a leader. And it's funny, every time I ask a guest what they like to do and what future plans on, it's always, I'm writing another book, I'm out, I'm doing another workshop. It's always about service because, and, and maybe this is from our end, if we've lived through maybe the challenges, the destruction, and we found hope. We found things that have just tr completely trans transformed our life. I'm 54, and I'm, I still play active rugby, Dr. Walsh. And I can't, there's not an old guy's team. I'm playing with these 20-year-olds. Oh, and boy. I, and, it, and I think that's part of the, when my dad died at 50, I thought, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to figure this out. 
And as I sort of figured out, I'm like, I'm going to go way above that. I'm going to just keep going. So I feel pretty good. I, I can still run with these young kids. And uh, yeah, you look good. I was noticed the way that you walk <laughs> and you talk and you stay and you sit and uh, you, you do look great. Well, and part of my, um, thank you. And part of my, uh, my, I guess success is I'm always running my mouth saying that I'm always saying you got to do more. You got to be stronger, be healthier, play sports, do something. And I keep telling everyone I play rugby and I, I back myself into a corner. <laughs> I'd have to keep going. So it's a, it's okay. Um, well, I, I, I thoroughly enjoyed our conversation and, and I know this is going to touch lives. I know this is going to reach people that uh, are maybe in the stage that they, they're going to see some hope. And they have well, please. They have your book. They have resources. Um, this interview alone should give them hope to say, you know what, this can be done. It just takes action. So, is any fun, crazy plans? And so I always answer and end my calls with this question: Any fun, crazy plans in the near future? <laughs> oh, no. I really, I, I love ordinary life. I, I'm a person who doesn't travel much or anything because every day is fascinating there's some things going my friends are around me I, I, and um it's sometimes it's sunny and sometimes it's raining and and then in winter we had beautiful snow just every day is a pleasure just wonderful that, and that's that's a wonderful way to look at it. i i think when i hit probably 50 or 52 <clears throat> i started having a different viewpoint i started to say wow you know what I'm going, I'm, I plan to live to 120. That's what I've been saying. So I'm not quite halfway there. I'm close. I'm 54. But I thought I'm on my like, like second part, you know, uh, over 50. I'm like, I got to start looking at this differently. And, and I'm starting to appreciate things more. I'm starting to appreciate the birds singing in the morning. And I saw a little bunny out this morning. I caught a little baby bunny on my farm. He was stuck and I picked him out of this little, he was stuck under a bush and he's squealing for his mom. And I thought, wow, how cool is that? So and I put him down and off he went. But you start to, you start to appreciate life. And I, and I pray that our listeners, that we can, wherever you are in your journey, whether you're 20 years old, you know, 60, 83, like Dr. Walsh, you say, you know what? I need to appreciate life, enjoy life. And you can enjoy life better when you're healthier. So take this challenge, start reducing sugar. Go buy Dr. Walsh's book, How I Recovered from Dementia. We'll have all the links on our, on our show notes here that all you have to do is click and go to it. So it will be very easy. I always say, if you're driving a car, don't do this now. <laughs> Just wait. So, um, Doc, thank you for being on the call today. I appreciate it. And uh, I, I, I give you the, the, all the energy out there from my end to, to keep this journey strong. Well, thank you. I appreciate very much being with you. <clears throat> and uh, not too far in the future, I will be maybe up at St. Peter's at the Pearly Gate, and they'll ask me, what did I do? And I said, well, I had this, this interview with this very nice doctor, and we had just a wonderful time. <laughs> maybe they'll let me in. They, they will. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank, thank you. you.